the world's most ancient living religion with roots that stretch back to before the dawn of recorded time to the Indian subcontinent with no single founder and no defined organization Hinduism has survived and thrived through Muslim invasion British occupation and the pressures of social change from within Hinduism was born of a civilization that existed nearly 5,000 years ago, around 3,000 B.C., in the Indus Valley of India. The earliest people there were known as Dravidians. They worshipped the mother goddess and the bull, and believed that gods lived in the mountains, streams, and other places in nature. By the year 2000 B.C., the Dravidian culture had all but vanished, replaced by that of Aryan invaders who came to India from southern Russia and Central Asia. The Aryans brought the Sanskrit language and a religion known as Brahmanism or Vedism, which like many other religions of the time, involved animal sacrifices. What little we know about the Vedic period comes from the Rig Veda, a collection of Sanskrit hymns and poetry composed between 1500 B.C., and 450 B.C. With time, the religion of the Dravidians and that of the Aryans combined into the earliest form of Hinduism. In the Tantra Sar, which is a scripture of Sanskrit philosophy, there's, there's a verse which says, Hingshayam duyateyascha, who abhors violence in every form. Sada acharana tatpara, who strives for harmony in every behavior. Ved go pratima sevi, who loves wisdom, who respects all teachers of wisdom, who practices some form of meditation. Sa Hindu mukashabdavak, such a one may be said to be Hindu. The gods of Hinduism number in the millions reflecting the infinite complexity of life. But this vast pantheon is seen as only the parts that make up the one divine being, known today as Brahman. Hindus believe in one God because the Vedas are saying, Ekam sad vipraha bahudha vadanti, that the truth is one, but scholarly people call him by different, different names. So truth is one, God is one. But we interpret, you know, that aspect of Godhead differently. And nothing is wrong with that. So, God is one. And He incarnates different, different times according to people's, you know, need. So, so He is one and He multiplies in different, different forms to comfort people. All of the other deities simply represent aspects of Brahman. Hindus believe that the deepest essence of the human soul, the true self, is identical with the immortal Brahman. Thus, everything in the infinite universe is embodied in an individual human life. The priests of Hinduism, also called Brahmans, achieved and maintained power by performing sacred rituals and sacrifices to please the deities. As the religion developed, new teachings arose. One of the most important of these was that of transmigration of the soul, the belief that all things must be born again and again. During life after life, by following one's dharma, or proper path, 
it was possible to ascend to higher and higher spiritual planes. I believe in reincarnation, which explains about the human hope to do better, and which makes a person responsible, the person. If there is no reincarnation, if I have money and wealth, everything, I could do anything. I don't have to repay. So reincarnation makes it clear. After many births, one could finally achieve release from the pain of earthly existence. The harsh life of an ascetic or holy man represented the quickest way to achieve release. Many people, both Brahmins and others, left home and went into the forest to meditate or wandered the roads of India, living a most austere life. Hinduism, as we know it today, developed between 600 B.C. and 300 A.D. The earliest deities to appear were Shiva, represented here, and Vishnu, who grew out of earlier Vedic nature deities. Slowly, public sacrifice began to be replaced by private ritual called puja, There are approximately 700 million Hindus in the world today. Although most live in India, Hinduism has spread to many other countries. In India, where religion remains an important part of daily life, the most widespread religion is that of Hinduism. Many people begin their day by visiting a temple to do puja, to pray, to meditate, to make sacrifices of flowers, incense, food, or money to the deities. Uh, meditation has great role uh, in a Hindu life, though not many people practice nowadays meditation due to you know lack of time and a uh, lot of responsibilities. Their priorities have been shifted to you know modernization. Meditation is the practice of the skill of paying attention. And through practicing meditation, we learn how to learn. We learn how to love. We learn how to respect. We learn how to worship. We learn how to be commune, how to become one with whatever it is that we choose to meditate upon. We learn how to enter into union. So meditation is not so much a practice of Hindu philosophy or religion as it is, is an essential ingredient for life. There are many places considered especially holy, and people go on pilgrimages to do their puja in these places. While most people in India have little material wealth by Western standards, their lives are enriched by their belief in God, as evidenced by their frequently performed spiritual practices. Among the most sacred features of the Indian landscape is the river Ganges, Hindus believe that this river poured from heaven to cleanse the earth of sin. Ganges uh, is the purest river for Hindus. And it is said that if you take bath on uh, specific days, so that will, you know, give you peace of mind and relieve you from the sins. You may have accumulated. On the banks of the Ganges, no place is more holy than the city of Varanasi, also called Benares, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on the face of the earth. Established by Aryan settlers, it was a center of religious life over 3,000 years ago. Here, millions of Hindu pilgrims come each year to bathe in the sacred waters to make sacrifices, and to pray. Hindus believe that if death comes in Varanasi, the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth will break, allowing the soul to achieve eternal bliss. Here, one of the fortunate is carried to the riverbank to be cremated.
A guru is a spiritual teacher, one who has achieved perfect understanding of the principles and teachings of Hinduism. The guru has mastered the inner world of the spirit and, as a realized being, has reached the top of the spiritual evolutionary ladder. Uh, a guru is, is an example of what we want to become. A guru demonstrates to those who wish to see how to organize life with God in the center and how to organize the rest of life uh, so that God stays in the center. And the guru demonstrates to us how that can be done. So the guru creates the inspiration and the example. The meaning of the word guru is to take away the darkness. They illuminate the light. Actually, the syllable gu means darkness. Ru means who takes away the darkness or who illuminates the light. Oh. Without a guru, it's very difficult to get an inspiration. Now, how do we proceed in spiritual life? The guru can intensify an individual's spiritual practice, thus hastening their karmic journey. This young man, initiated into monkhood, will live the rest of his life in the service of his guru. The ceremony takes place in an ashram, the guru's home and spiritual center, outside the city of Varanasi. The guru gives his disciple a secret mantra to repeat while meditating as the young man's mother looks on. Other monks perform a sacred chant as they circle the shrine of the ashram where images of deities and former gurus are kept. The Hindu temple is a place of personal contact with God. Temples are dedicated to specific deities, and each has a very individual character. This is a Lakshmi temple in Delhi. Lakshmi is the goddess of abundance and wealth, and her temple reflects that. Temple provides a place where people could come for advice, where people uh, could come to know the specific days for the celebrations. And of course, we Hindus uh, worship deities, so they come and worship their chosen deity, or all of them. So this provides a place for them for different, different uh, spiritual activities. Hanuman, the monkey god, was a brave and loyal soldier in Indian mythology. Hanuman temples usually have large populations of monkeys which run free. Great care and respect is given to the images in the temple since they represent the aspects of God. Offerings of food, incense, flowers and money are made by the faithful in order to show their reverence for the deity. With so many deities to honor, there are frequent holidays and festivals in the Hindu faith. Some of these are serious, and some are playful. One of the most playful is Holi, spelled H-O-L-I. This festival is held to welcome the spring season with its fertility and abundance. People buy colored powder and water from street vendors and throw it on each other with great good nature. In a more serious ceremony, the deity from a temple is paraded through the streets of Pushkar with great fanfare. Music permeates the practice of Hinduism. The sitar is one of the instruments most often associated with Hindu sacred music. It is descended from the veena, a three-stringed instrument associated with the goddess Sarasvati the Hindu goddess of learning and the arts. The sitar is often accompanied by the tabla, a drum which takes great skill to master, as it is used to produce very complex rhythms. 
The sacred compositions for these instruments, called ragas, are intended to be played at certain times of the day. There are morning ragas, afternoon ragas, and evening ragas, and they should not be played at a time other than the one they are intended for. Ragas are designed to produce a meditative state in the listener, and thus to deepen spiritual practice. Chants honoring the names of God are also performed at different times during the day. Sunrise is a particularly auspicious or important time for prayer and chanting. Pushkar Lake, or Brahm Kund, in the state of Rajasthan, is a holy place where the lotus petals of Brahma are said to have fallen to earth. Here, two men greet the rising sun with an ancient sacred chant. At the same time, a priest performs puja for a visiting pilgrim. There are 52 temples on the shores of this lake, each dedicated to a different deity. Ritual bathing in this sacred water is one of the ways of cleansing the spirit and winning the favor of the deities. Performing puja in a shrine such as this one is another. Many Hindu holy men or ascetics visit places like this as they wander through the countryside on their spiritual journeys. At the temples they are always welcome and find food and shelter. In India, it is common for men when their children are grown to leave their homes and begin the life of a renunciant, one who has abandoned worldly life. These men may have had families and been businessmen or doctors or lawyers when they were younger, during the householder phase of their lives. Now they have renounced worldly life and spend their time in prayer and contemplation as they wander throughout the countryside. Hindus believe all life is sacred, so they generally are vegetarians refraining from eating meat, and in some cases from eating any animal products. The cow is seen as particularly sacred because it is the most giving animal. It can be taught to work, helping to till the soil and to pull heavy loads, providing transportation. The cow gives her milk freely, providing a life-giving food, which can be used in many forms. Cows are therefore protected in India and are found in temples and on city streets, as well as on farms. The caste system, which developed at the time of the Rig Veda, has also been part of the Hindu faith. The system evolved from the four orders of society that existed then, priests, princes, traders or merchants, and serfs. The caste to which one belongs is determined by birth. In reality, it has kept Indian society fragmented for thousands of years. A person's caste is passed down from generation to generation and maintained by rules of marriage within one's own caste. Untouchables are outside the caste system altogether and perform the lowliest jobs of society, such as washing clothes and performing cremations. Mahatma Gandhi renamed the untouchables Harijans, or Children of God. As a result of Gandhi's work, untouchability is now technically outlawed, although it still exists and includes as much as 20% of the population in some states. In 1000 AD, the first Muslim attack on India occurred. Muslim power was firmly established by 1192. It is a tribute to the resilience of Hinduism that it withstood the rule of the Muslim conquerors of India from the 11th to the 18th centuries. 
Hinduism and Islam are as incompatible as fire and water. To Muslims, the Hindu way of thinking was a mockery of the Islamic faith. Hindus worship thousands of different aspects of God in the form of idols. They worship cows. They followed the caste system. And they did not feel a need for converts since they believed anyone not born a Hindu was excluded from the faith. To Hindus, Muslims had grossly oversimplified the complexity of religious thought. Muslims believed in one God, Allah. They were great proselytizers, spreading their faith by whatever means necessary, including the sword. Islam taught the equality of all people, regardless of skin color or social class, disrupting the caste system. Great violence resulted from these differences, and tens of thousands of Hindus were slaughtered. Their temples were destroyed, and from their very stones, mosques were built in their place. The wealth of the country was carried away by the conquerors. In spite of this, Hinduism survived and flourished. By 1800 A.D., the beginning of the modern period, Indian culture had been greatly influenced by contact with the Western world. As a British colony, India had been exploited for her vast natural resources. This contact left the Indians subjugated and bitter. Inspiration for the Indian independence movement came from the ideals of Hinduism and as a reaction to the oppressive colonial rule of the British. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the leaders of the independence movement, was a devout Hindu. He represented Hinduism well when he said, In theory, since there is one God, there can only be one religion. But in practice, no two persons I have known have had the same identical conception of God. In reality, there are as many religions as there are individuals. I always tell this thing that 20 students who go to a, a church listen to a pastor for 15 years. If one day pastor, uh, you know, honestly ask them what they have understood about God and put those, uh, you know, uh, experiences or concepts in 15, 20 lines and provides them a piece of paper and a pen, and if they are given the freedom, they would all write differently about God. Even one brother or sister from the same family would write differently. And even the pastor would write different. So how could pastor say to his students who have been taught by him that your concept of God is wrong, mine is right, yet nobody has seen the God. So either you accept all of them, which explains the multiplicity of deities in Hinduism, or you ignore all of them. Gandhi's teaching of non-violent resistance helped achieve Indian independence with a minimum of bloodshed, and then helped to resolve the difficult problem of conflicting Hindu and Muslim interests. In a most unlikely development, the Sikh religion grew from Hinduism and Islam, rejecting some of the principles of both and synthesizing others. This new religion developed in the northern state of Punjab in the 15th century. Sikhism brings together the Muslim concept of one God and the Hindu practice of following the teachings of a guru. The Sikh temple and religious services more closely resemble those of Hinduism, and Hindus have long regarded Sikhs as part of the Hindu religion. Sikhs themselves insist on separate recognition, and this has resulted in violence, including several political assassinations. Buddhism was also born out of the Hindu faith. The Buddha, which means the enlightened one, was born a prince in India in 560 BC. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. As a young man, he became disillusioned by the pursuit of comfort and pleasure. At the age of 29, he then renounced worldly life and became a holy man, wandering for many years in search of spiritual enlightenment. 
In his search, he came to the realization that enlightenment could be obtained without the harshness of an ascetic life. He founded Buddhism, the middle way, which teaches that the way to enlightenment is to be found neither in the pleasures of the world nor in the extreme mortification of the flesh, but on a more gentle path of compassion. The Buddha preached his first sermon here, in the Deer Park at Sarnath, near Varanasi. Hinduism is a complex and often misunderstood faith. It is as much a way of life as a religion. Hinduism's belief in the sacred nature of all life, and indeed of every part of the natural world, is of unequaled value and support to its followers at a time when there is a global crisis of both the spirit and the environment. With its great age and wisdom, Hinduism serves as a link between the past and the future. Its principles help to establish the world in an age of reawakening and healing. <laughs>